Hi everybody, this week we're starting with our introduction section uh, for our grant proposal and a big part of an introduction and a big part of proposing a study in general is identifying and developing the actual research problem and your purpose statement uh, for what you want to do. So your research problem is kind of like what's going on that, that, that makes us want to research something, right? What's the problem? Um, and your purpose statement is kind of like our why we we are investigating that problem and then we can ask research questions which basically how are we going to resolve that problem in some way and so that's what this little lecture will be about so the role of the research problem so all forms of systematic activity research evaluation or development right whether whether you're doing um, kind of theoretical work evaluative work or applied work may be considered as actions in response to problems. That is, we do research as a response to problems we identify. Problem statements serve an especially critical foundational role for research in that they communicate formally the reason for engaging in the study, your purpose as a researcher and writer, right? Why are you doing what you're doing, right? So research problems do not exist in nature just waiting to be picked up by the researcher, right? You know, it's like you just go to a tree and say, hey, I want this problem. Instead, they're artificial entities that come together through the intense efforts of the researchers um, who have identified a gap of information or understanding within a topic. In other words, we've identified a problem that has not yet been solved. In general, the information that forms the problem statement must first be introduced from the literature, framed around certain theoretical perspectives, and articulated in a way that clearly represents the interests of the research. Okay, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. So the three functions of problem statements. Problem statements represent the relationship between two or more variables that are at odds with each other. So um, when we have two facts that don't seem to line up, that means we have two variables that are at odds with one another. So we know one thing to be true, we know another thing to be true, when you put them together, they don't seem to make sense, right? And so the problem statement then justifies the usefulness of the information that might be gained by investigating that problem. So these two things don't seem to line up, uh, and this is why that matters, right? This is why that matters. Problem statements present the purpose of the study to address the troubling or perplexing situation, right? So these two things don't line up. And that's important because it affects this other thing. So the purpose of this study is to resolve that conflict in some way, right? Uh, and we'll look at some examples here, right? So um, problem statements establish the existence of two or more factors. In research, we often call them variables, right? Uh, in real life, we might call them facts that by their interactions produce perplexing or troublesome states that yield an undesirable consequence. In other words, problem statements represent the relationship between two or more variables at odds with each other. For example, here are two statements that are true, right? Uh, so HRD professionals, human resource development professionals consistently profess the value of, have, of using a systems approach to develop training programs. In actual practice, human resource development professionals seldom use all aspects of the system's approach to develop actual training programs, right? So if we all agree that it's best to use this approach to de developing programs, but in reality, people rarely actually follow that process, those things are at odds, right? The, the belief is at odds with the practice. To resolve these two points of fact that are in opposition to one another gives us a basis for doing research. We need to resolve these two points. We need to either understand why or make a change and apply that to the situation, or we need to even question the first uh, claim, right? That systems approach to developing training is actually something that uh, is of value because maybe it's not a value. We need to shift our function, our focus away from the systematic approach to some other approach, right? Systems approach. Um, so number two, the problem statements justify the usefulness of the information that might be gained by investigating the problem. That is, given that a perplexing or troubling situation exists, the following question might be asked. 
Many perplexing situations exist in human affairs, of course. So why is this one of any important, of any particular importance? Um, I usually talk about this in my classes as the so what, who cares moment, right? So why does this really matter? Well, the importance for understanding the two statements on the last slide might rest with the need for organizations to make effective use of their resources and the systems approach is better suited to ensure that this occurs, right? In other words, we all agree that it is the best way to do it, it's the most effective. Um, and so we want to make sure that the money we're spending is used effectively. So we need to figure out why people aren't doing the thing that we've decided is the most effective. So based on this justification, understanding how these two statements could both be true helps us build the case why these opposing statements deserve attention. Problem statements present the purpose of the study to address the troubling or perplexing situation, that is, what the researcher has planned in response to the opposing factors. There is an element of subjectivity in the context of the literature and what factors precisely are used to frame the problem and what goals are set for the study. In other words, as a researcher, we choose what we want to research. That's subjective, right? We make a choice. We're interested in it. We also choose what we think might be the best solution for that issue or the best approach for tackling that issue. And that's our purpose, right? So the purpose of this study is to investigate what aspects of a systems approach to training development HRD professionals tend to ignore most often and why they do so. So the way I've set up this um, purpose statement then also kind of establishes my method, what I plan to actually do later in my study, right? So I'm gonna, I wanna figure out two things, right? I wanna figure out what are the actual aspects of a system approach that people tend to ignore, right? And I might do that through something quantitative, right? That could be something I could just survey people and figure out. Um, I could also do it qualitatively. I could interview different people and talk about it, right? But at some point I would have to interview them to answer my second part of that purpose statement, which is why they ignore those things, why they do so. Um, but of course you can investigate this from lots of different ways, right? Different researchers will be interested in different aspects of different problems. And that's why there's so much research going on all the time because our research often only partially solves problems or even identifies new problems, right? Related to what we think we're working on. So how do we derive our problem statements? Well, researchers typically use something like the following process to derive problem statements. This is not meant to be interpreted as this is the only way it can work, right? This is just to give you a kind of guidelines for how it might work. Obviously, you start identifying a topic of interest. Second, develop expertise in the topic and its supporting bodies of knowledge through the literature and or personal experience, right? So, so we have a topic, we need to know something about it before we can kind of decide what to do about it, right? And then induce potential research problems through a process of continuously analyzing and synthesizing the information, right? So through our reading and through our experience, we probably will come across things that are two ideas or more than two ideas that don't seem to align and cause a potential problem. And that can be where, our, where we locate our problem for research. Confirm the relevance of a research problem through literature, discussion, and peer review. Um, right? So just because we think something is a problem uh, doesn't mean it hasn't been addressed elsewhere. So right, once you just kind of decide on your problem, it gives you a more specific topic to go out and investigate and see what have other people done, right? And one of the ways is through the literature, right? Reading what's been published about it. Uh, but another way is to talk to people or a discussion. Um, or to even work with your peers in, in examining that issue. And finally, construct a formal problem statement to ensure the logic of the research problem and communicate the problem to others, right? So the, the reason we have a problem statement is because it allows you to kind of formulate your own research process, but it also helps you communicate what, what problem you're interested in, why it's interesting, and what you plan to do about it for your audience. So here's some ways to gain in-depth knowledge about a topic. Obviously, literature reviews. The most common process for finding and developing problem statements is conducting a thorough review of the scholarly literature on the topic. 
The review should reveal what research questions have already been asked, which of those questions have been resolved and which we may remain open to further research, and what other questions might still need to be asked as new insights are gained. Personal experience. The old adage says that nothing can replace the value of personal experience. Indeed, the insights gained about a topic or situation when observing the phenomenon firsthand through professional practice can ground your research in the context of the problem. There is an entire um, approach to research built around relationships between researchers and practitioners, right? To bring that knowledge from a scholarly um, theoretical approach in direct contact with people who are actually in clinical and classroom experiences, right? Hooking up teachers with professors, for example, to work on K-12 issues. Um, there is no replacement for actual experience teaching and learning because a lot of things that in theory would make sense in practice don't work out. And a lot of things we do in practice when theorized can be better understood and modified to improve that practice, right? It's a reciprocal relationship um, between scholarship and personal experience in the classroom, right? Um, discussion with others. There is nothing wrong with carrying out conversations about a topic, your experience, and your research ideas with colleagues and peers. Indeed, encountering and addressing other perspectives can often lead to deeper and more meaningful research. If you've been a teacher, you have probably had those moments when somebody who uh, works with you, or maybe I works at another school, in a whole different environment, shares something that they do in their classroom and how it works with their students. And you can go back and bring that to your classroom and try it out, and you might find that it works really well, or you might find that, that, that it fails miserably, and that is an area that can be a research problem. Why does this particular practice work in this situation and not in this situation, right? Um, discussion with others is invaluable. Uh, research agendas are um, established professionals and their research teams often follow a line of research around the same topic. That is, you do a whole bunch of research on the same kinds of ideas over and over again because you are you become experts in that area, right? So this focus and depth of research can often lead to new research problems, right? As you dig deeper into a single idea or a single approach or a single setting, um, you will continue to find additional problems to research. Um, so as you grow as a scholar, you will probably find yourself developing research agendas around certain topics that are of interest or use for you. How do we find a gap then in our knowledge, right? So there are six interrelated forms of informational relationships, right? How to find a gap. One is the provocative exception. So when a consistent and accepted conclusion is contradicted by the appearance of a new finding, right? We all thought this was gonna be the same across all situations, but in this one situation, it doesn't appear to work or it appears to operate differently. That's a provocative exception, right? This is the, generally speaking, in most set settings, it's like this. However, in this case, it's not, right? You'll see a lot of research about inequity that is built around the provocative exception. And that is because a lot of research is based on homogenous populations. That is looking at education for all and for all tends to mean focused at the dominant groups and therefore pushing other groups to the margins right so you hear about marginalized communities um, and those are people who have not been part of this focus in research and that research isn't always about education that's research in medicine, that's research in anything that deals with human subjects. So as we start to investigate trends that we thought or practices that we thought were universal or could be generalized across different populations, we are finding that certain approaches 
work differently or don't work at all for other populations. In other words, there are exceptions to what we've always thought or believed, right? To these long held beliefs about education, for example. Uh, related to this is contradictory evidence, and that's when maybe there's a contemporary issue that a lot of people are writing and researching about, and they seem to be coming up with contradictory evidence, right? So we can get involved in that conversation and add our voice as one possible way of solving that problem, right? Um, so common core stand state standards um, are applauded by some and are derided by others and for lots of different reasons on either side and you can certainly look at the ways in which that evidence is contradictory and find your place in there to make your own argument. A knowledge void uh, seems unlikely but sometimes there is limited or no research on a topic in the field. You may find yourself researching something and you're like I can't find anything to really build from. A lot of times there are theoretical approaches that are common practice in other fields that you can apply to educational research. Um, that is one way you might find an, a, a knowledge void. So you kind of have to work with the approach from this other set of literature and find kind of reasons and justifications for bringing that into educational research. Um, or you might have an altogether new question because the world around us is constantly changing, right? So there is probably a knowledge void, I don't know because I haven't done the research, around what to do when your school gets shut down in the middle of a semester because of something like COVID-19. Um, now there's a lot of research happening right now about that, right? Kind of what are, what are school responses, what are student responses, what are parent responses, what are teacher responses, what uh, infrastructure is needed, what training is needed, what access is needed. All this research is happening now because there was a knowledge void created by a change in our circumstances, right? The action knowledge conflict is when individuals professional behavior differs from their espoused behavior. So that's like that example that we looked at before, right? Uh, human resource development says we should use the systems approach. However, most people don't actually use that, right? So that creates a conflict we can investigate. A methodological conflict, when the use of one or another research methodology may help provide a source for a research problem. So it may we've always looked at this problem by looking only in the local context. So I've been interested in how African-American students feel in my freshman writing classrooms. And to find that information, I've used a qualitative approach and I've interviewed a number of students. I've collected writing responses from a number of students to try to analyze and figure out this problem. Perhaps I will get different results if I shifted to a quantitative study of African-American students across all the classes I've ever taught over the past 20 years in higher education. Imagine if I can send out a survey to all my former students, right, and I can collect now thousands of data points. That's probably going to give me a different um, idea about that information that I've collected in the past. In other words, applying a different methodology has allowed me to, to approach the issue in a different way. Um, similar to that is the theoretical conflict, when the use of one or another theoretical model may help us, may help provide a source for a research problem. So sometimes problems have been, been looked at through lots of different theoretical approaches. Sometimes problems have only been looked at through some or one theoretical approach. How might looking at it from a different theoretical perspective, a different framework, allow you to understand that problem differently? That's what we're talking about. So in all these cases, what we're trying to do is to find ways in which we may look at that problem differently because other people have looked at it differently, right? Um, and what do we do about those 
discrepancies, those little problems that pop up when we do shift our focus or pay attention to those conflicts. And those are those gaps. When we talk about finding a gap for research, that's what they're talking about, right? What is the conversation around this topic and how do I jump in there to add something new that hasn't already been done before? Um, so when you think about writing your problem statement, there are four main components. You can have a principal proposition. That's a discussion that establishes for the reader what information is generally considered as being beyond question. So what's our first fact? What's our first variable? Our interacting proposition is the variable that conflicts with that, right? So a discussion that serves to contradict or show exceptions to or cast some degree of doubt on that principal proposition, right? Um, your speculative proposition then is going to juxtapose, put together, right, those previous two sets of information and suggest why that information is, why it's important to resolve this issue, right? So here's our first idea. Here's our second idea that conflicts with it. Here's our third idea, which tells us why that issue matters, for whom it matters, why that's so what, who cares? And then finally, your explicative statement or your problem statement, right? A culminating statement of how the gap will be resolved in the form of the actions the researcher intends to undertake, the purpose of the research study. So here's some samples, right? Uh, principal proposition. Historical records suggest that central Ohio typically has a relatively mild winter weather pattern. As a result, local newspapers have reported few disruptions of daily life caused by weather. Pretty straightforward, right? Central Ohio has a calm weather pattern in the winter, right? Um, the interacting proposition to that, though, is however. Notice that signal word. That's one of those signal words, however, although that signal contradiction, right? However, the past five winters in central Ohio have been especially harsh with temperatures ranging well below the daily averages. As a result, most schools have been closed more days than their allotted number, right? So here we have our problem. Our problem is between these two contradicting statements. First, that typically central Ohio has mild winter weather patterns. Contradicting that, however, is the most recent five winters, in which case we've had harsh weather. Our speculative proposition then, if Central Ohio has had relatively mild winters in the past based on historical information, and if the recent winter weather pattern suggests a new weather pattern, which may have detrimental effects on daily life, then more must be known about the most current weather winter weather patterns of central Ohio, right? So um, because of this, this, this uh, discrepancy, this contradiction we've seen between these two sets of data, right? Historically mild winters, new harsh winters. It can matter because it disrupts our daily life. So we need to understand it more, right? So first proposition, here's, here's what's been going on. Second proposition, the exception or contradiction. Third proposition, why that matters. Explicative statement, the purpose of this study is to investigate the recent winter weather pattern and its effect on daily life in central Ohio, right? This is what we are gonna seek to understand in our study. Uh, it, just a quick note on manuscript organization. It is good practice to develop your ideas through the syllogistic process of building from statements to conclusion. But when it comes time to revise your work for publication, you should follow the publication guidelines and rhetorical expectations in your organization. One common organization expectation is the front loading of your explicative statement. Something you've probably heard called the thesis, right? It is your, your purpose statement, right? Placing this statement toward the beginning helps the author to focus on what information to include in the manuscript and helps demarcate the explicit intent of the manuscript for the audience, right? Uh, so if you've taken an English class where they said, you know, end your first paragraph with your thesis statement, that's why, because they want you to have that thesis up front so people know what you're arguing. Um, in something like a proposal, that's not necessarily true because you'll have an abstract at the beginning that is going to clarify all of that for you. Uh, the next step, once you have your purpose statement, is your are your research questions. So the purpose of the study is further refined through research questions. You have two sets of questions. One is your central question. Your central central question mirrors the purpose statement in a question form. So 
How do middle-aged white males who perceive themselves as having a stalled career experience this work transition? So if our purpose is to understand how white ma middle-aged males who perceive themselves as having a stalled career experience that transition at work, we turn this into a question because remember our research is always going to seek to answer our questions about our topic. From that central question, though, you could develop a whole series of sub-questions. And, and I'll encourage you to kind of limit your sub-questions to those that are most interesting and related to your perspective on the topic. Um, generally speaking, you should have between 2 and 12, depending on how long your piece is, right? So something like a book might have 12 sub-questions, and something like an article might have 2. Um, so, you know, manage your expectations in that way. But they should flow from the central question and represent aspects of that question. So you might ask, what is the influence of the perception of a stalled career on productivity? What is the influence of the perception of a stalled career on organizational commitment? Right. In other words, how much work do these people actually get done? And how committed are they to the organization if they feel like their experience in, at work has stalled out? Right. And what is the impact of, on, of these workers on the workplace power dynamics? So then uh, how do those workers who feel like their careers have stalled make other people in the organization feel, right? That's a different kind of question. And there are many, many more, right? These are just three examples. So when you think about the introduction section for your paper or your proposal, what you're thinking about is how are you going to set the stage for the study that you have conducted or you want to conduct so your audience can understand what you're doing and why you're doing it, right? Which will lead in your methods, which is how you did it, okay? But in your introduction, you're talking about two parts, research problem and your review or framework. Um, research problem starts with the background to the problem. What is the problem? Uh, what do we need to know for it to make sense? What's the context? Um, problem statement and purpose, right? What are the contradictions? Why is it important? And what are you going to do about it? And then research questions. What is this study going to actually seek to answer? This is followed then by your literature review, which oftentimes includes some kind of discussion of theoretical framework. Um, and that's when you go through the literature and explain how other researchers have looked at this topic or um, considered this approach and how that leads or connects to what you're hoping to do. So your background. The research problem opens with a background to a problem written in one, say one to three paragraphs for a, you know something like a proposal or an article that situates the study in a broader context. For example, historical, national, or international, right? What is the issue and, and, and where do we see it? Who does it relate to? Um, it should hook the reader, provoking interest and making the study relevant or important to the reader. And it often starts with a researcher's narrative or experiences or a story, right? So it's a great, great way to kind of kick this off and get people involved in your topic is to kind of share your own experience, tell your own story, a little narrative um, to kick things off. You could talk about somebody who was affected by this issue. You could talk about how this issue impacted your experience. Uh, so on and so forth. Um, then you work towards your problem statement and purpose. So the background is followed by one to three paragraphs that formulate the actual problem statement. So what we just walked through in this lecture, which illuminates the phenomenon, what happened, uh, concept, issue, or dilemma that needs to be investigated. In other words, what's the problem you're looking at? Why does it matter? And what are you going to do about it? The problem statement identifies a gap in the knowledge about an issue or phenomenon. The purpose statement points to what needs to be done to address the gap. And the research problem determines uh, research design, analysis, and presentation results because the elements of the study and language used to describe this problem and purpose identify theoretical and methodolog methodological information. And we'll talk about that more as we move in through the course. The research questions may be provided in paragraph form or in a list. Uh, the central question turns the purpose into a question that the study will answer. The sub-questions will ask about considerations related to the central question. Not all authors place research questions after the purpose. Sometimes they appear just before the method or early in the methods section. For now, go ahead and write them in your introduction. 
Um, your review or framework. The introduction presents a review of relevant empirical, theoretical, and conceptual works in the form of a literature review, a conceptual framework, or a theoretical framework. This subsection fulfills five functions. To build a foundation for the study, to demonstrate how the study advances knowledge, to conceptualize the study, to assess research design and instrumentation, and to provide a reference point for the interpretation of findings. In other words, to build a foundation for the study, it gives us information about the topic and what other people have done to look into that problem. Related to that, it demonstrates how the study advances knowledge because your purpose statement says basically what you are, your study is going to resolve about that problem that hasn't been resolved yet. In other words, here's the problem, here's what other people have done, and this is how this study is different and advances that knowledge, adds to that knowledge to actually conceptualize the study. So uh, when you're thinking about like how you want to do the study, what approach you want to take, it's helpful to see what other people have done. Do you want to do something similar to what they've done? Do you want to take a different approach to what they've done because you think it's going to yield different results? In other words, it's going to help you understanding more about what's already been done about this problem is going to help you think more deeply about your own problem and your own approach to that problem. To assess research design and instrumentation related to that, right? So how have other studies approached this problem and what have they actually done? What instruments have they used? Have they used a standard survey that you can employ in a different way? Have they only looked at it quanti quantitatively and you want to look at qualitatively? Um, have they done interviews? Have they looked at written documents? And right, so looking at all this, different ways people have investigated this problem can help you think about how you are going to investigate this problem and provide a reference point for the interpretation of the findings. In other words, if a bunch of different people have approached this topic and found a bunch of different findings that seem to conflict with one another, um, can you, from looking at that, that previously published information, um, manage your expectation of what you think your findings will suggest, right? Uh, will you find, fall on one side or the other? Will you fall somewhere in the middle? Um, do you think all these things that you can garner from understanding how other people have looked at the issue or problem? Of course, if you have any questions, send me an email. I'm always here to help. Thanks.